Today is October 16th, 2008. We're at the home of Mr. Herman Rady at his home in Greeley, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Good morning, Herman, and well, uh, thanks for uh, participating in this project today. You're entirely welcome. Let's start out, if we could. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. I was born on a farm southwest of Gilchrist, Colorado. It actually had a platinum mail route. Grew up on a farm and helped Dad on his farming operation. I did graduate during that time. I graduated from Greeley High School then, not Greeley Central, Greeley High. And then in December 1945, excuse me, December of 1941, the day of my 21st birthday, the United States declared war on Japan and Germany. So that was December 8th? December 8th. Do you remember where you were and what you were thinking when you heard that Pearl Harbor had been bombed? I was at home, happened to be listening to the radio, and it talked about bombing Pearl Harbor. I had no idea where Pearl Harbor was that day. However, the next day, on the 8th of December, my 21st birthday, war was declared upon Germany and Japan. I did enter the service on March 31st, 1945. Took basic training, infantry training, at Camp Walters, Texas. Now, you enlisted? No, I was asked to join the effort. Okay, and that was... And the, it drafted. Uh, the Army, correct? Yes. I okay. Was. Took basic training at uh, Camp Walters, Texas. Actually, we were being trained for the invasion of Japan. Mm. However, one week after finishing basic training, while on delay en route home before shipping out, the bomb was dropped and ended the World War II. However, I did ship out overseas. Can I interrupt you and ask you your, your opinion on that? There's been all sorts of opinions on whether Truman should have dropped that, but being someone that would have been part of the invasion, what's your perspective on that? From my standpoint of view right now, it may have saved my life. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure of this. It saved my life and probably many, many other American soldiers. However, I did go overseas. I was spent a little over a year in Incheon, Korea with Army of Occupation. Army of Occupation, they were trying to help South Korea reestablished the government of their own. The company that I was assigned to was a port company. There were no docks to unload the supplies for the American troops over there, so they dropped anchor out in the bay. It was our company's duties to transport with landing craft and supplies to shore. On the night of December 20th, after having gone to bed, I woke, hearing wood burning. And I raised my head and looked around, and the whole floor around the tent stove that we were using to heat our quarters with was on fire. Oh, geez. Well, needless to say, when a fire department did get there, the fire hydrants were frozen, and when it, the fire finally quit, the only thing left of our quarters were the foundations. Everybody got out okay? Everybody was out okay. There was about six of us that, when the order was given to abandon the building, there was a window right near us, so we stepped out the window and went out the back way. Going out around the back way, we were picked up by a, a Korean policeman. He may have thought that we might have something to do with the fire. Took us to the police headquarters and we just stood around there for probably half an hour or so. And then finally he left and we looked and said, what are we doing here, we'll leave. So we went back to across the street from where our company was stationed and there was another company there. And as I walked in the gate, a friend of mine, a buddy, ran up to me, report in, report in. We have taken a roll call three times, you fellows are missing. But it so happened that nobody was injured or hurt during the fire. But after that, we were quartered in an old factory building 
There was no heat, no electricity. You said this was in December, correct? This was oh, in December. Uh, we would dress up at night. We would put on a pair of socks, two pair of clean fatigues, crawl in the uh, sleeping bag and shiver and hope, hey, well, is it morning coming yet? Yeah. <laughs> but we made it through there. Then we were removed from the town of Inchon, where this was at, out to Walmado Island. It was connected to Inchon by a causeway. There I had an interesting experience as supply sergeant. The transformer for electricity in our company blew up. Quartermaster sent me a purchase order to go to a company in Inchon that was starting up business as an electrical company and uh, to buy a new transformer. I knew about much Korean as big does about Sunday school. But it took that and, okay, yes, 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 yes. I got the transformer and then I asked, how am I going to ask whether they put it up? So I said to them, you. <laughs> <laughs> so luck would have it, our motor pool had a boom truck with it. We took the old transformer out, and a fellow in our company knew something about electricity, put it up for us. But it is amazing what you can do with sign language. Yeah. And then after that, I came home back to the United States, landing in uh, Seattle on the 11th of November, 1946. Had leave time accrued until my official discharge says, 29th of December, 1946. Okay. Well, if you don't mind, I'm going to I'm going to pick into this story a little bit and ask you some questions. Uh, let's start out with uh, how was your transition from from uh, civilian life into the military life, and what was boot camp like for you? I can use my favorite expression. Camp Walters, I always said, was the only place on earth where you could stand in, in mud up your butt and have sand blowing in your face. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't sound too good. <laughs> Conditions there, huh? Well, going to Texas go, from Colorado in the summertime, this was summer uh, taking basic training and the heat and the humidity there was different from what I was used to at home, yes. Now, when you left for the service, did you leave by yourself, or did you have buddies that were uh, recruited as well? Or I had uh, acquaintances. One of them is uh, Jack Shoup. Jack Shoup and I uh, were inducted the same day. In fact, our serial numbers were only 15 numbers apart. We were sent to the same camp in Texas, took the same basic, went overseas on the same ship, Happened to be assigned to the same company. He turned out to be the company clerk, and I was a supply sergeant. We came back to the United States on the same ship. Is that right? And in fact, I was one of the best, I was the best man at his wedding. Huh. I'll be done. Well, let's talk about, let's talk about that ship crossing over. I mean, here you're a, a farm boy from Colorado. Uh, I've heard all sorts of stories about these, these uh, ocean crossings. Talk a little bit about conditions on the ship. Did you get your sea legs? Uh, uh, f funny part was, going over, I never did get seasick. Hmm. Uh, the one picture that burned into my mind, and I still see it today, the night that we sailed out from San Francisco and underneath the Golden Gate Bridge, it was getting to be sunset. And for some reason, I don't know why, but I feel myself standing on the fan tail of the ship, watching the ocean spread out the trail of the ship. And I stood there and I prayed, please let me see that bridge again. Mm. Wow. Still have that memory all these years later. It's burned there forever. Yeah, yeah. On the ship, Henry will verify this with me, it was the worst food I ever ate in my life. It honestly was. We were only fed two meals a day. 
and the dining room was just tall benches, about waist high. You just walked up to it, set your gear on the table, and ate. And I'll always remember this also. I was pulled on the KP one day, and it was my job to open cans of salmon. But we didn't use a can opener. Give me a big, large meat cleaver. You set the can, uh, can up on the counter, whack. One can, the end of it was bulging out. And I set it aside, and one of the ship personnel came along and says, I have a can of bad salmon here. His remark was, what the hell are you, some kind of a health inspector? Put it in there. I did. So that's the type of food we had on the ship. Wow. How long, how, do you remember how long the crossing was? Did, did you go well, straight to Korea no, or did you make no, a stop? No, no. After out to sea three or four days, we changed course and headed almost straight south. We, they had developed engine trouble on the ship. So we went down to Pearl Harbor, pulled in there, saw all the damage there. Was there still quite a bit of damage? Oh, yeah. yes. Because yeah. the war had just been over with a month. Yeah. And uh, they uh, unloaded us. We were at Hickman Field. They called it 13th Replacement Depot for, I don't know, a week or 10 days. Then loaded back up on the ship and sailed to uh, Okinawa. And there we swung around the anchor chain for a week, waiting for a sister ship. Same structure as ours. Then we followed the minesweeper on up into Incheon. Now, did you know, leaving San Francisco, did you know your assignment? Did no. you guys? Okay. No. You had no idea where you were heading? Had no idea where we were going. So that, that pretty much played into your that thought, too, as you looked yes. at it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I had no idea. Even, even after we left... Uh, Okinawa had no idea where we were headed for. Hmm. They didn't tell you more than I had to. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so all together, how long do you figure it took you from the time you from left? From the time we left the States until we uh, got off at Incheon was about 40 days. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> how, and uh, you, were you, able, you got off in, in Hawaii, were you able to get off the ship in like Okinawa or stuff? Or were you... No, not at Okinawa, no. Yeah, it, uh, yes, it, uh, uh, Hawaii at Pearl Harbor, we uh, were allowed off the ship. I did get a pass one day to even go downtown. Other, uh, the rest of the time was on details of cutting weeds or whatever. Uh, wow. Okay, so you, you land in Korea. Do uh, you remember your first impression of Korea as you landed and got on shore? What? Uh... I don't know that the first impression I remember that too much about that, but it was the backwardness of the country. Now talk a little bit about that. What you got. The country, Korea had been under the Japanese rule since 1915. And then during the agreements and treaties of World War II, it was divided north and south. So we were there to more or less police action, I think till they could establish their own form of government again. And uh, of course, the company I was with was the main job was getting supplies to our troops so they'd eat and rebuild. Okay. And once you got the ship, you went to this barracks that had burnt down or were, was yes, it? Yes, uh -huh. okay. it was, what, actually it wasn't a barracks. It was a, uh, the warehouse, it was a warehouse. It was two buildings. I think going back to this fire, uh, one building was quarters in the mess hall. The other building was supply room and quarters. There was a driveway between the two buildings. Well, when the fire got to the uh, supply room, there was 80,000 rounds of 30 caliber ammunition there. Of course, it was all stored in the metal boxes. And if you ever heard of popping popcorn, it popped that time. Oh, geez. Uh, what were conditions of your uh, of those quarters uh, before it burned down? Was it pretty comfortable, or what was? No, no, they and were not comfortable because 
Oriental people heat their homes different than we do in the United States. So thereby they don't have chimneys for heating our uh, bar, uh, quarters there. There's no chimneys, so you knock out a pane in the window, and it had tent stoves, and it run the, the pipe out the window. Because you're on the waterfront, the humidity was very, very heavy, so consequently all the soot was running back in and dripping on the floor. So to prevent the, uh, the dripping, you tilted the uh, pipes downward a little bit so it would run out, Thereby, you cut off the draft, and consequently, it was always smoky in the, in the building. Hmm. Uh, we had one fellow, we called him the fire guard, and it was his busy to chop wood and go around about 4 o'clock in the morning and start all the little tent stoves up. And, and that's why when I heard the wood burning, it can't be morning, and that's when we discovered the fire. Oh, I'll be done. Uh. Was uh, food any better than when you were on the ship? How, how was... uh, oh yes, it, it it had to be better. Was... <laughs> There's nothing worse than the USSC Barb. <laughs> uh, what was conditions like in the in the spring and summer when uh, when the weather was hopefully a little bit better? Was there any uh, summer? The weather conditions were fine. Uh, however, here in summer months is when they would empty their cess pools and haul it down past your quarters and you could smell it for a week afterward. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. What would be a, a, a common day for you there? Uh, your assignment and such, what, what would be an ordinary day be like for you? Uh, it was more or less a work day. Uh, for me, uh, uh, eight, 8 to 5 in the supply room, the men that we were actually doing the uh, loading and unloading of the ships. Did an eight-hour shift, and then they rotate day swing shift and midnight shift. So they unloaded ships 24 hours a day. And then uh, we had three different companies, and each company took their turn on the swing and swing shift or midnight shift, whatever it came up. So your responsibility was in the uh, in the supply room. Supply room. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it got so it seemed like all of a sudden all the fellows were, didn't have enough shorts. So I was ripping them in half and turning in two so I could turn in two pieces so I could get two for them. After a while they stopped me on that. I couldn't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have uh, much interaction with the local Koreans at all? Or? Not a whole lot. Uh, although there was, I did not know of any hostility. Uh, and most of them were very friendly. In fact, at that time, I could buy a carton of cigarettes at the PX for two and a half dollars a carton. So for a carton of a week, a little old Korean lady did my laundry for me. We'd wash up the fatigues and bring them back and fold them just as pretty. So it cost me two and a half dollars a week for laundry. And wages at that time weren't what they are today. After taking my wife's allotment out and in insurance, I was paid thirty-two dollars and fifty cents a month. <laughs> <laughs> that was my total paycheck, thirty-two fifty a month. Isn't that something? I mean, today some people make that in an hour. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> huh. Now you mentioned your wife, so you were you were married when yes. you went over. Mm -hmm. uh, talk a little bit about that. How uh, how long were you married before you? We were married about nine months before I went in. Uh, Of course, you have the feeling that the world must go on, and I found a young lady that I thought I wanted to spend the rest of my life with, and well, we'll just face it from here on out. And we did not have any children or started any family until after I came home. So I just had the wife to remember at home. And in fact, because in a supply sergeant that were there, our company, just before I left, was deactivated, so all the equipment was transferred to another company. The new officer, commanding officer of the new company, would not sign for anything unless he saw it. Well, I had begged, borrowed, and stole more stuff to, that we were our company was charged with, 
and I got him satisfied for the equipment. And after that, my commanding officer asked me if he could submit my name as a second lieutenant and a quartermaster. I says, I saw the letter. That would mean I'd have to stay overseas another year. No, not overseas, here in Korea another year. And after thinking of it for, now it seems like only seconds, I says, I have a wife at home and I think it means more to me than the commission. He said, that's exactly what I thought you would say, but I won't offer it to you. Uh, I'll be done. Did you, uh, do you remember when you, when you left home and left your wife uh, to, to go off to the service, what that was like? The same yeah, of course, it's heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah. It's got to be heartbreaking. Sure. Did you have a chance to see her before uh, before you shipped out? Uh, yes. Between yes. That, after, sort of basic, uh, after basic training, I was able to come home. They called it delay en route. Uh, I was home for about a week and then went back out to the coast and got ready to ship overseas. How about communications back and forth when you're overseas? How was uh, was that as far as getting mail and by, such? By letter only. Yeah. There's no such thing as cell phones or anything. Yeah, sure. Telephone yeah. conversation is by letter only, and it would take about a week for mail to get over there. Wow. 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 You had mentioned when we were talking earlier before we started the interview that you had a couple of Koreans that were kind of special to you that you dealt with. Can you talk a little bit about them? Uh, I had one young fellow. That the United States government hired some of the civilians over there to help around the base to uh, janitorial or not necessarily outside cleanup and any odd job you'd have done. And one young fellow by the name of Kim helped me a lot in the supply room and each day I would give him a word to learn and by the time that I left over there we could almost keep conversation. Hmm. And uh, when I left, he gave me a picture of himself. He begged and begged for me to take him with me. He says, I'll serve you for the rest of my life. Wow. But you had to say goodbye. Yeah, right. And then one other thing that burned a picture into my brain, there was a little girl that evidently had the duties to babysit for her little sister. I guess it was her sister. But she'd come to the barbed wire fence every day and keep calling, Saru, Saru. But don't ask me what Saru meant, whether a sergeant or a mister or whatever. Maybe it meant something else. And I would go out and give them a piece of candy. They'd be satisfied for the day. The next day they were back, Saru, Saru. <laughs> <laughs> but the smile on her face when you handed them the candy for a little girl. Ah, uh, wow. Did you ever have uh, any more contact with... Uh, no, no, never, I never did. Never, mm -hmm. ever happened with those guys? Either. No, I have no idea. Uh, now, did you guys ever get off the base and able to go explore the country at all, or uh, were you pretty much stuck on the base, or...? Pretty much so on the base or into Inchon. Uh, did get a leave one time, the sheriff always went up to, to see the state capital, Seoul. We did spend a day up there, but as I said, transportation was practically non-existent, so you had to catch a supply truck or something going up there and make sure you had a one coming back or you, Made you would be able. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> uh, tell, tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, from the perspective of a, a farm boy from, from Colorado. I mean, you saw some, some different things as far as Hawaii and Okinawa and, and Korea. What was your perspective? I, I imagine up to that point, you probably hadn't traveled too far away from no. uh, growing up from the farm, so this was... Uh, this it was entirely different. And looking back after I was through with it, I was very, very happy that I had done it. But I always said, I don't know that I would do it again for a million dollars. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Uh, so you were there, if I got this correct, in Korea about a year, and you got uh, your discharge, is that yeah, there, or how did that work out? Well, uh, after you term limits came up, and then you were able to board ship and come back home. And you were asked earlier about seasickness. We left over there 
on the U.S. No, on the Ufella Victory ship. We left about four o'clock in the afternoon. And you'd think that having been in service a couple of years, you had to learn things. But after we were in our quarters down in the ship, somebody came along and getting everybody's name. Dummy me, I thought he was getting a roster. If I'd have had any other indication of what it was up to, I'd have been Henry Schmick or Mr. Pope or somebody else. But after getting my name and three or four others, he backs up and says, all you fellas report to gallery are on KP. Oh, geez. I had heard the rumors that if you had a full stomach, you wouldn't get seasick. Another burning picture. That night we had sauerkraut and wieners for supper. I loaded up on sauerkraut and wieners. Well, needless to say, by 8 o'clock that night, we were in pretty cho choppy water, not being used to sea legs. And it was about 10 o'clock. I just did barely make the garbage can, and I said, this is it. I'm going to go sack and sack out. So I went back to bed. The next morning I got up, felt fine. And we hit some very, very rough water on the way home. For a couple of days, the front end of the bow would come up and all you saw was blue sky, and then it'd come down. Yeah. The screw would come out of the water in the back, you could feel the whole ship vibrating. Henry remembers that. Then the current turned, and we went from side to side. On the little ship's newsletter, they said the ship would lean as high as 47 degrees before it capsized. We were going 43. Mm. We'd come over here and dip water, and we'd come over here and dip water. If you went to your bunk, you had to tie, uh, use a tent rope to put around yourself because it was really out of bed. You never got seasick. Is that right? You <laughs> never got seasick. The only time I was seasick was that first night, and I'm not sure it was a seasickness that did it. I might have been some, a sauerkraut and wieners. Yeah, right. <laughs> was the food any better on the, on the trip back? Oh, yes, there was better food. Yeah. Uh, but when the ship was doing the side to side listing, Again, we were allowed two meals a day. You had a meal card, and as you went through the line, they'd punch it. And there we did have our tables were like picnic tables with a bench on the side. And a young fellow by the name of Suda, I don't remember his first name, big husky farm boy from Nebraska, went to sit down for breakfast, and the ship list, listed up as mess kit right off the end of the table and he just picked it up and left. We came in for supper that night and again, a, a burned picture in my mind, we had stew for supper that night. Well, he went to sit down and he wasn't going to let the plate get away from him this time, so he sat it down, hung on to it, it was coming in, but he had set his canteen over here. Come up and the canteen falls over and right through the plate and out the other end, left one piece of meat. <laughs> So every one of us gave him a little bit of ours. He got as much to eat the rest of us then. <laughs> uh, and did you return, uh, come back into the States via San Francisco again? No. We came back into Seattle. Okay. And then reported uh, Fort Lewis, is it up there? And then by troop train down to Camp Beale in California, discharged at Camp Beale. Okay. And then Beale, you came back uh, back to Colorado? Mm hmm You remember? Been here ever since. Remember that? <laughs> Remember that homecoming when you got back? Yes, I did. Yeah. <laughs> I had a wife waiting for me with open arms. Oh boy, it must have been a wonderful feeling, huh? It was. Yeah. And then what did you do um, thereafter? You, well, I guess my question then would be uh, similar to the question I asked you earlier. Now, how was the transition back from military life back to civilian life? Any? Uh, very, very welcome. Yeah. Very, very yeah. welcome. Yeah. However, as I said earlier, I was born on a farm and been farm boy most of the time. And it was late in the year when I got home, and there were no farms available for love nor money. So I had to find something else to do, and lo and behold, I got a job at the County Clerk and Recorder's Office during the license plate rush to help issue license plates. And stayed working for the County Clerk and Recorder for 12 years. And in that time, the inflation of World War II, cost of living went up, a whole lot faster 
and the county wage scale went up and I had to find something else to do and found a job with Northern General Tire as uh, assistant manager and salesman. And I was there for 25 years. Oh, wow. Uh, I'll be darned. Mm. Through the years, uh, have you kept in touch with any of your uh, buddies? The service said you had your best friend there, but uh, yeah, anybody uh, else? And any yeah, reunions? And our, our mess sergeant that we had with us, he was from Minnesota, uh, Lowell Torgerson. Swede known to us. Jack Shoup and I a number of times tried to locate Swede through the address that we remembered he was from. No such luck. And then, probably what, about 10 years ago, something of that nature, one afternoon the phone rang and the guy says, is this Herman Rady that went to Korea, was in Korea? And, yeah. Do you remember a guy by the name of Torgumson? Swede, where the hell are you? He says, I'm at a 7-Eleven here in Greeley. Yes, I said, what 7-Eleven? Well, I don't know. He says, I can see a sign there say such and such. I says, you stay right there for about three minutes and I'll be there. So we got reunited with him and his uh, wife then. And they were on the way through Greeley to visit their daughter in Albuquerque. And he had remembered my name and also Jack Shoup's name, and he got on the phone and started calling. I'll be done. Huh. And then we went back to Minnesota for their 50th wedding anniversary. And then another young man we visited with, he was uh, from Kansas, and after the service he was stationed. He was living at uh, Cimarron, Kansas, near Dodge City. And uh, two or three times when we were going for a drive down to the Woodstock and stay overnight there at Dodge City and have breakfast with him. Has your unit ever had any sort of reunions or anything like no, that? No, we never have. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Um, well, I'm trying to think what else we could, uh, did you ever join any of the Organizations like the VFW. I have been a member of VFW for since way back in the 50s. However, I, I have not been a very active member, but mm -hmm. I am a lifetime member mm -hmm. uh, because of other things that I enjoyed uh, church and Lions Club. And you get spread out so thin that I sure. thought that one more was too many. Yeah, yeah. Herman, how do you think uh, that period of your life played into your life or affected your life? Did it have any part? I, I think it, it probably did, yes, because seeing some of the other fellows that were lucky, maybe just a little bit younger than I was, that were not drafted or did not go into service, and the advancement that they made in the farming field, I think I lost quite a little because I could not afford to get back into it then. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. That's too bad. However, I've been very happy. Very good. Well, is there anything I didn't ask you uh, or any stories you can remember now that we didn't talk about that you'd like to, to, to talk a little bit more about? It doesn't come to this people mind drawing right off the top. Yeah, yeah well, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough there. Well, I guess as, as we kind of come to the end of this interview, is there any uh, closing statement you'd like to make in regards to anything uh, to, to those that will see this tape? Uh, any thoughts about anything, I guess? It's a, kind of an open mic. Uh, no, just uh, going back, that I look back, I have really not enough to been sorry that it did go. However, if it's an open job and you, I don't know that I would have gone again. Yeah. But I saw parts of the world that I would, would not have had the opportunity to see otherwise. Ever had the opportunity to go back to Korea or any, no, any other places? I've never had the opportunity to yeah. go back. Yeah. Okay. I did have the opportunity to go back to uh, Hawaii and see Pearl Harbor and see the memorials there, which was different than what was when I was there the first time. Yeah, I'll bet. Huh. Well, 
I guess uh, we'll uh, we'll wrap up this interview. I uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to tell your story today, but uh, more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Well, you're welcome. This just gives you kind of an overview of what age has done for me. <laughs> this was when I was a young man, and now I'm waiting for the next trip. Can you talk a little bit about what uh, you've got here in this frame? Uh, the, in the frame, it shows my Master Sergeant uh, stripes, number of years in service, and down here the World War II Victory Medal and the Asiatic Theater Medal. And the, the top were... The uh, top, this is a uh, Harbor Craft Company. The Lonely Hearts was part of the 7th Army and the Seahorse signifies uh, a port work. Okay. I'm going to zoom in here on, on your picture. Uh, when was this taken, do you remember? Uh, probably 1945. The picture of these little girls, each day they would come by and call for me, at Saru, Saru, and I would they'd go out each day and give them a piece of candy, and they would be back the next day calling for me again. Huh. Not having any motorized hearses in Korea, this is a picture of a Korean funeral. It is transported somewhere on the shoulders by survivors. This is a picture of a young man by the name of Kim that the United States Army hired him to work on the base and he worked with me in the supply room. And as I said earlier in the interview, each day I would give him a word to memorize, and by the time I went home, we could almost keep a conversation. Hmm. Just a little bit of horseplay partaking in part of the taxi service in Incheon, Korea. Are you in that photo? I am the motorized part of that. Okay. <laughs> this is the aftermath of the fire that I spoke of earlier. And it also shows the hill to the back of the quarters where we took refuge during the fire. So you 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 guys came out up out right of there. Back up over here. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is a picture of the servicemen aboard the U.S. You fell a victory just before disembarking at Seattle, Washington. So this was the ship ride on the way back. This on the return ship. Okay. I'm focusing in. Get a focus. And you said that's you right, right there. Right there. With, with, uh, cradling the box camera. Let's see. That's you right there, right above the porthole, correct? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay.